My name is Norman Krieger. I teach piano performance in the keyboard studies department here at the Thornton School of Music at USC. And we're here at the uh, beautiful Doheny Library um, in a beautiful quiet room here. So <laughs> silence is important when you're talking about music. So I'm delighted to have this chance to um, share a little bit about my philosophy and uh, the philosophy of our piano department. Uh, here at uh, the Thornton School. I grew up here in Los Angeles actually as a very young child. Um, my parents and my grandparents were uh, Eastern European Jews that survived the Holocaust. And um, when I was very young, um, it was very important that a young person study an instrument regardless of whether they were going to pursue it as a career. It was just a given that in order to be a well-cultured individual, you needed to study music and study an instrument and, and try to play it the best that you can. And so that's how I started uh, uh, my relationship with music. Um, subsequently, when I was uh, about seven, my mother took me to a concert uh, at the Hollywood Bowl here, and um, there was some violinist by the name of Yasha Heifetz playing, who I'd never heard of. You know, I was seven years old and didn't know who this person was. And um, as soon as the sound that he created on his instrument came across the speakers, because, you know, you couldn't really hear, it's an outdoor amp, you know, venue. And so we were sitting way up in the 17,000th row or seat. And something went through me like an x-ray. When he started playing, um, it transformed my existence on this planet, planet immediately. Um, and I was so overwhelmed by this sound that I heard um, that I, I left my seat and I ran down to the stage. My mother nearly had a heart attack because here I was seven years old and I just I wanted to meet this guy because I couldn't figure out, there was something about that sound. Um, and by the time I got down to the stage, he was already gone in his limousine. But you know, it was a very subconscious, conscious sort of event in my life um, that was like a calling almost that uh, um, from that moment on, I really didn't have a choice whether I would become a musician or not. It was that music was as important to me as food or water or drink or sports or any kind of uh, experience that we have when we're alive. So um, my mother then started taking me to regular concerts with the LA Philharmonic at the, at the you know, Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and I would hear Zubin Mehta and Rubinstein and David Oistrach and uh, Rudolf Serkin and uh, Beverly Sills and um, uh, all these great artists and I would sit in the first or second row as a kid and I would see how much th th this was a life or death experience for these people when they walked on stage and they were bringing to life the music that was written 300 years ago or 100 years ago or, or today um, and um, so that was very much a part of my youth of my early even preteen life and um, so I, I, I wanted to play the piano on that level. I didn't know if I was capable of it. I didn't even think about it. But I was, I, I can remember sitting in the front row and seeing Serkin and Andre Watts and uh, Rubinstein and thinking to myself, you know, these people are speaking to me when they're performing. There's something that's touching my soul. And I want to, I want to do that because I love the music. I, I, I was, I really felt a connection to the music of Beethoven as a very young child. And um, so my parents then took me to, I started studying with my uncle, you know, when I was very young and then went on to another teacher who recognized that I did have a talent. And so she worked with me for a number of years and then I was sent to Juilliard and I worked with the, uh, great professor by the name of Adele Marcus for you know, quite a few years in my bachelor's and my master's degree and um, subsequently entered competitions and went off to, to Europe, worked with Alfred Brendel and 
uh, Maria Curcio and then came back and did my artist diploma at New England Conservatory with um, uh, Russell Sherman. And But I should jump back because before I left Los Angeles at the age of 15, I did study with um, uh, Rosina Levine who was teaching here in the summers. So I had a connection to USC as even as, as a very young uh, uh, student. My responsibilities fall into the, into the category of trying to um, recognize whether a young person is destined to have the kind of concert career that they think they can have or want to have or whether it is balanced by other aspects, you know, by wearing different hats of collaboration, of teaching, of research. Um, you know, th those, those are really, really important um, signals for me as a teacher is to recognize what a student's strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and try to guide them and encourage them to um, focus on the areas uh, which need honing. You know, and so one of the the things that I always like to compare pianists to, which people don't do, is that you know with singers it's very easy. You say, oh, he's she's a coloratura soprano, he's a dramatic you know tenor, or she's an alto, he's a you know basso profundo. But with pianists, very rarely do they do we do we get categorized as we should. Because not everyone can play Brahms II, not everyone can play Rachmaninoff III, not everyone can play Mozart D minor concerto, not everyone can play the Schubert Lieder. We all have our own Fach, as they say in German, you know. Uh, and so, as a teacher, I immediately, when I audition, when someone auditions for me, uh, I try to identify their talent. And if they're versatile, which is great, you know, chances are they are going to have strengths in a certain area. Let's say you get a young person that has an affinity for Liszt or for contemporary music or for Baroque music. You know, well then, if they're going to come into the Thornton School of Music, my job is to try to focus on those strengths but yet find a balance of repertoire of music that they can focus on while they're here to get to the next level of their artistic life and internal life so they can branch out when they leave school and use what they have learned here to connect the dots, so to speak, into the real world. You know, if, for example, the times we are living in now are very similar, in my opinion, to the time that Mozart lived. It's a time of transition. In the 10 or 11 years that I've been here, for example, I am now getting students that really acknowledge contemporary music as composers that are alive today. Not Prokofiev, not Shostakovich, not Schoenberg. You know, 20 years ago you, you mentioned who's a contemporary composer and they would say Schoenberg or they would say um, Copland and you know, God rest all of their souls, you know, but those people lived 100 years ago. But today, and in addition to that, you know, on our campus we have living composers that we can call up and ask questions about their scores. Think about the last 300 years, how many times, you know, I've wanted to ask Beethoven, why did you put this accent here? Or Bach, why didn't you give me any kind of clue dynamically what you're doing here? Here, you know, a student can pick up the phone, study a piece by Hartke or Lordson, you know, or Mull, and, um, and, 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 and inquire, you know, get an answer. Um, so, that is the richest kind of environment, I think, for an, an artist, scholar, student to be in. Um, but going back to my particular philosophy, which I believe my colleagues share in my department, is that, you know, when you're getting students here that are removed from a generation of gestures, you know, like how do you describe a classical gesture? You know, the only comparison, and, and when you're looking at the score and you see a phrase marking, you know, how does one connect the dots today in terms of, you know, if Mozart walked into a room, he wouldn't say, hi. He would say, you know, good afternoon, your highness, or, you know, a very formal kind of greeting. Well, that is integrated into the way he writes. It's the end of a phrase. It's the beginning of a phrase. It's the silence, the, the rests, you know. And so um, 
I always try to tell my students and to encourage them when they're studying a work of Mozart is to look at his operas, you know, look at the chamber music, look at the symphonies, get away from the keyboard aspect and, and realize that the keyboard is an instrument to be used for an artistic end, not an end in itself. And therefore, if you approach Mozart, for example, vocally, or instrumentally on the piano, if you try to imitate the flute or you try to imitate the human voice or the percussion, suddenly a whole new world of nuance, inflection, grace, um, intellectual wit opens up, you know. And a lot of young people, I find, don't relate that enough. You know, you, 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 we as pianists, of course, spend so much time alone we have the melody in our right hand and we have the accompaniment in our left hand, so we're not dependent on other instruments for um, the success of a piece, you know, unless it's a concerto, of course, or chamber music. Um, but 99% of the piano repertoire is solitary. <laughs> um, but the truth of the matter is 99% of the repertoire that we teach here at the Thornton School is inspired by other things that has nothing to do with the piano. It has to do with symphonic music. The, the 32 sonatas of Beethoven, you can orchestrate every single one of them. Um, the music of Liszt, it's operatic music written for the piano. Um, uh, you know, the music of Liszt, of course, like Wagner, changed the whole size of the stage of sound. You know, by the mid-1800s, you're dealing with a, a scope, a range of projection that's completely different than the music of Schubert or Mozart or Haydn or even Mendelssohn. The stage has been enlarged. It's, it's been, you know, um, so teaching a young person how to project in a hall uh, to the person that paid five dollars or five rubles or, you know, five rupees in the back of the hall, depending where you're from, is very important. You know, you... you the music of Schubert, for example, was probably written for a room the size we're sitting in now. Uh, the scenario, or maybe not even this big. So chances are a young person's going to get into a situation, hopefully in their life, where they will be giving a lecture or a performance in a, in a 2,000 seat hall. You know? And just having the modern piano is not enough. I think how one conceives of sound in, in the present day compared to the way it was written 250 years ago is very important. You know, um, for example, anything written from Bach, Haydn, Mozart, Schubert, Beethoven is basically a transcription in the modern world on the modern piano. The, you know, if you listen, and so, you know, when a student comes in and brings a Haydn sonata and there are all of these interesting markings on the score, accents, wedges, uh, pauses, I always try to encourage them, first of all, to go back to the source, to find out, well, what was Haydn writing at this time? Why did he put these markings in? What was his instrument like? And so you'll find that 200 years ago that the instrument he wrote on actually had much more variety of um, inflection in terms of the, the, uh, the ranges on the keyboard, there's much more variety than on the modern piano. The modern piano is very homogeneous. I mean, from the bass all the way to the top, it's basically one even texture. And that's what a lot of people want. But when you're playing classical music or Baroque music, you know, if you go back to the original source, you see, you start to understand how the, why these composers wrote the way they did. And then comes the translation of how do we do this on the modern piano? How do we take this music and be respectful to the composer, respectful to the score, the period, the style, and yet bring it to life today? That's what I feel my responsibility, where my responsibility lies as a, as a, as a teacher, is to, is to share the traditions that I've been taught and yet make them usable in the present day and to convey the gestures, the gestures that were that I have been taught um, over the years that don't exist anymore. The most important element regarding everything that I've said has to do with integrity and a standard of excellence. Because in classical music, I think one of the things that seems to underline 
the survival of the greatest composers and performers is the intolerable aspect of not being true to your soul and being true to what your capacity is in, in terms of artistic excellence, not settling for 98%, but really um, going for the, the highest standard possible and without, you know, ending up in an insane asylum, you know. So that is, is part of the tradition that I try to encourage. It's a long process that takes a lifetime as we know, but within the two years or four years that a student is here, I feel that I can sort of try to encourage them, even if let's say they're 20 years old and they want to come in and play Opus 119 of Brahms and they've only played one piece of Brahms before, I will say immediately, I think that that is very courageous on one hand. On the other hand, it's like a first year med student being put into a room and expected to do brain surgery, you know. Uh, but at the same time, the challenge, which is obvious, is we're living in an age of instant coffee, instant gratification. And so many of these great works that have been composed by the composers took so long to materialize, to put together, that telling that to a young person sort of challenges their whole concept intellectually, emotionally, spiritually of, wait a minute, you know, I'm, I'm paying all this money or, you know, I'm going to the school, I want, you know. And so it's a painful realization, I think, but I think that's, you know, we learn from our mistakes. And I try to encourage someone in that situation to take the early opuses of Brahms first, or the chamber music, study a few works of chamber music, his songs, study some of the chorale works, so you can see how he writes, you know, some of the earlier, you know, opuses and uh, sonatas, the early, and then think about Opus 119, but why jump, you know, you got, there's some students that come in and, and want to play the Liszt sonata and haven't played anything else of Liszt. So, um, I think I have to sort of take in the reins and say, no, we're going to study a couple of his concert etudes first. Um, we're going to study maybe one transcendental etude and um, maybe one of his song transcriptions of Schubert so that you can see how he uses the instrument lyrically before you jump into the most mature work that the man you know, has written. From the educational point of view, it's very important. I think that it's also important where, to know where the student is at in their life. You know, some students have come in and they've studied most of the Beethoven sonatas. I mean, maybe not thoroughly, but they've actually, I've had some, or all the Chopin etudes, which is great, you know. Um, I always call that, it's like putting money in the bank. You know, it gets interest later on. You know, because you study it, you put it away, you come back to it. It's like studying Shakespeare as a young person. You know, you, you, you learn it, you put it away, you come back to it, it has deeper meaning. Uh, but to develop very specific skills physically, I think one, again, depending on the individual, needs to develop a solid technique at a young age and a solid understanding of style at a young age. And, you know, how do you teach the Baroque style? How do you teach the classical style? How do you teach the Romantic style? And, you know, how do you teach the contemporary style? Because it's so diverse and so free, and yet has a standard of excellence built into it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, context is terribly important, and I think also being able to recognize quickly what a student's, where they are. You know, because, you know, you'll get some students coming in the bachelor program, for example, here, that are at very different stages of development and have very different aspirations. Some want to be performers exclusively, some want to perform and teach. Some aren't sure what they want to do, and yet are very, they wouldn't get into the school here unless they were talented. So that even creates more of a challenge for, for me, is how do I not inflict my own persona on that student, but how do I embrace their long-term development quietly, maturely, and in a way that I feel they will benefit the most from and, make, and, and ultimately be able to make a contribution you know, in, in, in their fields. There's no question that the more information one has, you know, the, the better it is. I mean, certainly understanding 
the period, I mean the classical period, with the political, you know, ramifications of Mozart's day in particular, um, you know, how he had to overcome um, obstacles when he went to Paris and then, you know, back to Salzburg and dealing with patrons and royalty and travel. I mean, when I, you know, it boggles the mind today sometimes when I complain and I go on tour and I come back and I'm dealing with lines at the airport. These people traveled in horse and buck, you know, in these carriages over the most in, you know, what we would consider, they probably, you know, thought it was better than being on a mule, but, uh, you know, I mean, it's invaluable. I mean, you, you know, you can't study the Lisby minor sonata without reading Goethe's Faust. I mean, it would be ludicrous, you know. You, you can't, uh, I mean, so because so much, also because so much music is coming out of the liturgical, you know, religious aspects and, you know, then becomes secular and then goes completely off in a different direction. Um, I think it's terribly important to understand the, the forms of church music that existed in the Renaissance, medieval period, how that influenced Bach, how that influenced uh, Pergolesi, how it influenced Rameau, and subsequently, you know, Haydn and um, uh, uh, Mendelssohn and Brahms, you know, I, I mean, all of these, all of, all of that is terribly important. Uh, but more, most important, I find as a pianist in particular, is the influences on the great composers that had nothing to do with the piano. And yet, then they, trans they, they were forced to use the piano as an, as an instrument, not as an end in itself. But people like Beethoven then were, were pushed, inspired piano builders to make instruments that had longer strings, where the pedals would resonate longer. And then Liszt comes along and they, he pushes the envelope even more, where he turns the piano literally into an orchestra and into an opera. So piano builders had to make even bigger instruments. Um, so the key, I think, is transcending the instrument. It is, and to never forget that the instrument is an instrument to be used for an artistic end, not an end in itself. And that's I think the underlying philosophy I have with my students is to never forget that this box, this black and white, you know, with 88 keys, is, is, it's a dead piece of wood. It's what we do with it and how we use it that, that makes it communicate to the audience. And whether it sings, whether it speaks, whether it screams, whether it whispers, whether it you know, howls, whatever it does, whatever the composer tells us to do, that's why it's there. And um, it's easy to forget that. You know, it's easy as a professor to notice right away that when a student is having problems, it's because, well, they're having technical problems, which then does not enable them to express the musical result that they want. So then that's my job and I need to help them, show them how to use their hand, how to use their body, how to use uh, breathing, how to uh, practice something. You know, how they work is the most important thing. It's not just how they play, but how they develop the, in the practice process, you know, um, that is so important. The fact of the matter is, here we are living in the 21st century and most of us have been taught on 20th century or 21st century instruments. So therefore, we have to develop certain physical skills to play these modern instruments. Well, you know, the fact is when Beethoven lived, there, there weren't Chopin etudes. When Mozart lived, there was no transcendental etudes of Liszt. Or, so their instruments were very different. Yet, in order to conquer the modern instruments, we have to, there are specific technical exercises that have been handed down over the last 200 years to strengthen the muscles, to, to free up the wrist, to give us agility. You know, there's a regime like the great pianists of the past would use, like Rachmaninoff, like Liszt, um, Levine, Hoffman, where they would practice an hour and a half of technical exercises every day. And um, so, that being said, they develop certain fantastic skills over the modern instrument. Now they go back and they play a work of Mozart. Well, 
that's another challenge because suddenly you have all you have this 250 horsepower arm in hand that's playing on something that only had a 15 horsepower let's say kind of action needed you know and so that is a different kind of challenge how do you then transcend the the the, the future that you've just dealt with and go back to the past and so that's Another interesting and wonderful challenge, which I love because I always tell my students, you, you have to embrace the style, but you need to play in the present. There's no way you can play 200 years ago. There's no way you can play 10 years ago. You have to play today. And you have to be honest about the way you feel now about this piece, and yet embrace the style. So it's probably comparable to a lot of operas that you'll see of Mozart and Wagner where they use modern sets and modern clothing that makes you sort of, it challenges everything, you know, um, rather than seeing it in the traditional costumes, you know. I mean, um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it's more about the director than it is about the composer or the, or the message of the, of the work. And so, getting back to the piano, I think that you know, how you phrase a Mozart andante in the 21st century has to be in the style of the classical period. <clears throat> Subconsciously, you will, you will take everything that you've learned about what happened after Mozart's time and integrate it. But hopefully it will be an asset, not, you know, I can only imagine, for example, like in Bach, if Bach were alive today, would he use the pedal? on the modern piano? Would he use the dynamic range? I think the obvious answer is yes. You know, a lot of people won't even touch the pedal when they play Bach because they're afraid it's, you know, you know, reinterpreting the Bible. And um, to me, it's not. To me, if, in my mind, if Bach were alive, he'd probably be a jazz musician today because, you know, he was into improv, you know. And uh, so I always try to remind my students that um, this instrument, again, is a means to an end, not an end in itself. And all the technical wizardry of a Rachmaninoff or a Liszt can only benefit how you mold a Mozart phrase. Because the fact is, on the modern piano, in order to mold a phrase, you have to have very strong fingers, you have to have a mobile wrist, you have to have a developed ear. And all that extra knowledge of what happened after Mozart can only enhance, I think, if one, if one really looks back, you know. And it's constantly changing. Um, for example, a lot of my graduate students um, are so creative when they come into the school and so um, intuitively entrepreneurial. I have, you know, now I have a couple students in my class. Uh, one young student who's playing um, for her lecture recital all of these new works by Chinese composers that are living here in the United States that immigrated here. And um, I have another student that's, that's doing a program um, 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 on contemporary music written after 2000, you know, for a lecture recital. So, you know, the fact of the matter is in today's society, in today's world, which is changing as we speak, we have to wear many hats as pianists. I, I think the days of just being a touring concert pianist or exclusively a teacher are over. I think that we need to encourage all of our students, and I certainly try to um, have them look at careers as performers, as teachers, as collaborators, as composers. Today, a student is more likely to come into a lesson with a Mozart concerto and have written their own cadenza or uh, a set of preludes that they want to include on the recital than even 10 years ago. It seems that the need to create and to, to reinvent themselves in a sense, in, in not in a self-conscious way but in an internal kind of way, is, is, is necessary. And um, I find that very, very exciting. I find, you know, putting together programs that are interesting for audiences is so important. I, 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 re I don't, even though I think it's wonderful to have a balanced diet of repertoire, Baroque, classical, romantic, contemporary, 20th century, I, n I rarely encourage my students to put a program together that starts with Bach and ends with 
you know, something modern. I always say, why not start with the modern piece, then do something by Bach, then, you know, it's like going to a restaurant. You, you, do you want to have the, well, maybe for certain health reasons, people like predictable menus. I don't. I love surprises. I love contrast. I mean, when I go to a concert, I don't want to hear necessarily, and I don't mean this as a tactic or as an effect thing, but, you know, it's like speech. If you're talking at the same volume all the time, you're going to fall asleep faster than, you know. So when you go to a concert, you want contrast. You want color. You want nuance. You want passion. You want uh, to be challenged intellectually. And I find with young people, especially about to go into the real world and, and face um, uh, trying to find a way to survive, you know, the, the creative aspect and the, uh, knowing their strengths and their weaknesses is, is so important and how they program, how they, pre how they present themselves. Um, more academic institutions, I think, are, are much more attracted to that today than they are the tr traditional box that I certainly don't encourage. I, I th if anything, I think you have to have a solid grounding in all the styles and all the traditions which are so important, but at the same time live in the present, you know, recognize what is existing in the world today, what, what other, what other, what are composers writing in Finland, what are they writing in Australia, what are they writing in, in, in the Eastern Bloc countries. I mean, we have this wonderful technology to access that information now, and I think it's, 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 terribly important and um, exciting. And I think it's happening, I know it's happening here at the Thornton School. Just from the physical point of view, I think most of us know that when you exercise, that you know, when you go through a certain physical motion, you're supposed to inhale, I believe, or no, right before it, and then exhale. Well, I think that the ebb and flow of all music reflects, uh, certainly music written from the Baroque period until the mid 20th century has the element of singing, dance, and speech. And the most immediate response I would have is, okay, a rest is the time to take a breath. But that may not necessarily be true, depending on the composer on this time. I think Haydn is a wonderful example, or even Mozart, of where rests sometimes can be almost lack of oxygen, a kind of, you know, stopping, being hit by, you know, a wall in a sense, or a moment of um, contradiction where, you know, what you've just played is actually going to be inverted and you realize it, but you don't like it, but at the same time it's luring you forward, you know, so, but breathing in terms of the muscles and play, if you're playing etudes is terribly important, you know, just like tension relaxation, the in, I hate to use the word tension, I like musical tension, but I don't like physical tension. I think physical intensity is terribly important. That's something that I teach, is how, how do you focus the intensity of energy to the tips of the fingers and keep the rest of the arm and the wrist and the body quiet, you know. I mean, that, but that again depends on your training. Some people, I was trained in the great Russian tradition, old Russian school tradition of Anton Rubinstein and um, uh, Neuhaus and Levine, and that was part of their aesthetic, you know, which is that you mastered the instrument first and then you became a musician, you know. Whereas in many other parts of the world, it was you first you become a musician and then you learn, you sort of find your way with the instrument. Um, but there are many great famous pianists today that have traveled that road. I won't mention their names because I don't want it to sound negative, but there are many great artists that were never really trained as pianists, but uh, focused more on chamber music and collaborative and then went into the solo repertoire. Um, and then you get pianists that were trained in that old tradition of that you master all your scales and your octaves and your chords and your arpeggios and your Chopin etudes. And then you come to Schubert and then you come to Beethoven and Haydn. And then, you know, that's a different kind of, that's, that's more of the school that I was brought up in, you know. Uh, but I mean, both are valid. And, you know, I don't, I don't say one is right or one is wrong. They're just different, you know, it's like, you know, uh, certain artists that were trained, like Degas, you know, was taught to imitate all his, 
you know, all the great painters before he would even paint his own. You know, I mean, that's, that's, um, there's no right or wrong. I think either it works or it doesn't work. That's in the end result. I would have to say that I, you know, my heroes, aside from the composers, you know, were my, my teachers. Um, because, you know, to actually sit next to or watch a Del Marcus demonstrate a phrase um, or um, Alfred Brendel, you know, play something right next to you and discuss it with you and why, you know, or, um, uh, you know, I mean, there's no question. But on the other hand, you know, I can remember as a student in New York going to hear Montserrat Caballé sing a recital and just, or Evelyn Glennie play the Schwantner percussion concert. And I thought, this is why I'm a musician, that this is what I want, you know. Um, uh, or um, hearing the Berlin Philharmonic live for the first time and thinking, yes, this has nothing to do with orchestral playing. This is about the music. This is about the soul of the composer. It's alive. It's three-dimensional. I can touch it. You know, I can, I, <laughs> you know. Um, there's, I mean, but, you know, at the same time, I would have to say that my teachers were so important to me in terms of technical understanding of the instrument, how to create sound, how to use the piano. Um, in some cases, strong, the strongest personalities that, I was, expo that I, were, I was exposed to would underline what I didn't want to do in music, you know. I think it's very healthy, quite frankly, when a student is told something by a strong personality and they listen to it respectfully, hopefully, and then leave the room and say, you know, I don't really agree with that. Because I think it's so important for every student to be honest with their voice, internal voice and their soul. I mean, if you read historically about all the greatest artists, they all reach a point where they say, they make that break, you know, where they say, no, I'm going to... But, you know, I don't encourage it with all my students. I just say, look, I want you to be honest at the same time. Respect what I'm telling you while you're here. You're, you're you know, totally allowed to take it with a grain of salt when you leave here. Uh, but I think it's very important. You know, I, maybe this is not such a good thing. I don't know. But, you know, my teachers were like dictators. You know, this is, do it this way. This is, but that is old European tradition, which is great at the time. But now, you know, we're living in different times, and um, I would hate to see the old traditions lost, you know, in terms of just artistic values and standards of excellence. At the same time, you know, I try to encourage a balanced psychological life for my students, you know, um, because, you know, in the old days, you were married to your work, period, and whoever you were married to in real life was just secondary, and they were serving you so you could serve your music. And that doesn't really exist anymore in the real world, I think, as much as it used to. You know, I mean, uh, Toscanini's wife served Toscanini. Horowitz's wife served Horowitz, you know, because Horowitz was serving music. First of all, I think the quality of the training is so important. I think the discipline, um, of daily application is very important. Um, the love that the child shows, if there is, and there is talent on top of it, you know, is important to be recognized and respected. Um, I think the whole aspect of the career or, ex or sh getting the kid to perform at a young age is not necessarily a good thing. I think then it's more about the parents than it is the child. Um, I think taking the child to too many teachers is a bad thing. Um, I think finding a really good teacher, taking the time to find that teacher is very important. And hopefully having that long-term process understood that it's going to take time to develop, you know. And um, not be afraid to, to encourage that child to practice regularly. And, and, and to know that this is a long-term process. And there are fun pieces you can learn on the way that you can play, you know, but that it's a slow, it's like a tree. You plant a tree, you water it. It's not going to become one of the, what do they call it, Yosemite, those sequoias. 
in two days. It's going to take a lot, not hopefully not as long as it took them, but you know, it, it takes time. It takes time to develop. It takes time to really absorb in depth and learn. And that's a challenge for a lot of parents because, especially if they're not in the arts or music, they're used to instant gratification and quick results, you know, and what is the career opportunity here? And I was, you know, it's funny, all the great teachers that I had, from Adele Marcus to Alfred Brendel, always said, Norman, don't think about the career when I was a teenager. I said, don't focus on that. Don't focus on the externals. Be a light that people will be drawn to you about. Don't, 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 don't look at it in terms of, you know, um, reaching to the outside. It, it's this, this, this whole process is an internal growth process, and you know, it takes time, it takes nurturing. And so I've, I've, I, I remember that, and I always tell that to my students. You know, it's, it's, it's a yin-yang, you know, how do you balance your career with the artistic growth? I mean, that's certainly something that is important, it takes time, and a young person needs to know that if you're going to go into music, certainly as a performer, you have to really want it more than just about anything. Um, and the, the journey in itself is the most rewarding aspect of the process, not the concerts or the reviews or the record. You know, I mean, that's, those are the, you know, that's wonderful, or the degrees even. It's, it's, it's the process of learning. It's that whole uncovering of what did Beethoven mean when he wrote, you know, Adagio Sostenuto in the Hammer Club here? It's like, and then all of a sudden you, you figure it out and you're like, and then you hear it. That's the reward, you know, that's, that's the, uh, uh, the success as far as I'm concerned. Um, but it's also wonderful to see students graduate and get jobs, you know, and be able to survive in this day and age as musicians, you know. Uh, that's, that's great too. I mean, it's important. So, well, thank you for your time. Thank you. I hope that that was helpful. <laughs>